I feel like I've finally started to be a little more forgiving to myself in terms of pace. Welcome back to the Career Therapy Podcast for another edition of Life After Layoff. Today, we are joined by Wayne Kim, who according to your LinkedIn profile, you say you are a user experience researcher, but we always like to go deeper than that. So Wayne, tell us about yourself. Yeah, you know, it's a pleasure to be on. Really excited to speak more today. Um, I'm, you know, in the UX research world and what I do is better understand the, the user needs and jobs to be done of different user segments that we're serving. And so utilize a different uh, variety of research methods to understand that, as well as work with internal stakeholders, you know, across uh, different business units and also uh, vertically to C-level folks. And I in my free it. time, yeah, do a lot of uh, surfing and cycling. And so, yeah, just... Uh, you know, with this new new normal, have a little bit more uh, time to delve into those passions as well. That's awesome. And you're in the San Francisco area, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Very cool. Well, well, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to dig in and learn a little bit more about your background as a user experience researcher and, uh, you know, a little bit about your layoff story. I know everyone who goes through these things has a slightly different experience, right? It's not all the same across the board, which people dealing with people, but there's a lot of similarities. And I think that there's, you know, a fair amount of emotion that goes into all this too, whether it's shame or disappointment or betrayal for some folks, you know, you never know what people are feeling. But, um, you know, before we jump into the layoff story, Sure. I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you got into the world of user experience. Um, what, what drew you into that world and what was your background before that? I think it really all starts from, I uh, grew up in Southern California, uh, son of immigrants from South Korea. I went to college in Maine, a smaller bar school called Colby College, and studied sociology there, which gave me the tools to really analyze the world around me with multiple lenses, kind of like going to the eye doctor and then, you know, one, two, three, four, getting all so those cool. different prescriptions. Yeah. And um, afterwards, I decided to travel uh, across Western Europe and Northern Africa for about three months, uh, primarily to do the Camino de Santiago. And that's where I really got to take a step back and just kind of, you know, get off this track of like, I need to get a job immediately and really listen to people's stories and understand their experiences. And the lens I was primarily really interested in at the time was higher education. Uh, the cost of education, it's still quite astronomical, mm -hmm. um, but also the value of the liberal arts and whether or not folks in Europe or in Australia uh, viewed it in the same way as folks in America. And um, I always knew that I wanted to go back uh, immediately back to higher education either in the dean of students route or the dean of admissions route and ultimately decided to pursue the admissions route to better understand like how students you know really find a good fit when they go to college and you know also end up uh you know going to and through which we'll talk a little bit about later um ended up working at reed college a smaller rural arts school in portland oregon as an assistant dean of admission and got to travel all throughout the states, primarily in the South, the region that I've never traveled before, and really got to connect with students and families. And again, really understand their experiences and really understand what they're looking for in, you know, a college experience, both inside and outside the classroom, and how we could deliver on that experience. Obviously, you know, as with any organization, as well as the involving needs of students and families at the time, you know, there are areas of improvement that we needed to invest more resources toward. And so I became a lot more involved, not only just getting students, you know, in the quote unquote pipeline, but also working across different departments, you know, such as the Dean of Students Office, financial aid, you know, campus life, faculty, really starting to build a more cohesive experience to get students who, you know, sometimes may have felt they don't belong either in the classroom or outside the classroom and really start aligning the institution with those student needs. I spent about three years at, at uh, 
free college, investing a lot of time and effort into that. But ultimately, I wanted to come back to California, start looking at jobs uh, in San Francisco. Definitely a little bit more fast-paced environment was something I was looking for as well. And Raise Me came onto my radar after I developed a uh, junior fly-in program um, for students from underrepresented backgrounds uh, to come and experience the campus. And from there, I joined Raise Me, which is an ed tech startup based in San Francisco, as initially on the partnerships team, and eventually trans, uh, transferred over to the user research and uh, experience team. And from there, how I got about that experience was being on the front line, working with colleges and universities, you know, vice presidents of enrollment and admissions, and also their, you know, the users of our product, the director of financial aid, data operations, and understanding again, where are the challenges and opportunities and leveraging moments of empathy, but really learning that empathy is obviously a skill that, you know, I continue learning how to become better at. But I think what's really important for user researchers and something I've been thinking a lot about is it's not just having moments to collect those stories, but also aligning it with business goals at hand. Because quite frankly, a CEO or really a lot of C-level people don't have time to just like, great, that's an empathetic moment, but how does this relate with the business at hand? How does the rate re relate with ARR, with customer churn, retention, engagement? And so I think in this space of user research, we have to play a role as researchers to really show our value proposition to the organization at hand. And I was lucky to have a wonderful manager as well as wonderful teammates on my own respective team, but also cross-functionally in product and in design in order to make that transition. And you know, it took a lot of self-learning, a lot of uh, hustling outside of work hours because I still needed to do partnerships before officially transferring over. But in the long run, we ended up you know, identifying a lot of great problem statements, uh, helped out with a company pivot in terms of strategy and start building out a couple of features before we start encountering a couple of layoffs. That's amazing. That, I mean, everything you just laid out there, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating from, you know, a user, you know, experience researcher perspective, but also from a job seeker perspective, because a lot of these things relate, right? Building your job search is very much a research project. It's very much a, uh, you know, user project and, and understanding who the hiring person is, understanding what the company needs. And what you mm -hmm. said here, you said show the value proposition. And then what I noted down was the ROI of empathy. And I think <laughs> yeah. that the ROI of empathy is something that's not talked about enough. Uh, there was this uh, one idea that we read about, I think it comes from Buddhism, but it's, um, it's like wise selfishness. It's kind of understanding the mm -hmm. like, uh, cyclical nature of like doing good for people and like trying to think about things in a, in a mutually beneficial way um, rather than being like too kind or not kind enough, right? Trying to stay in that middle area. And I'm kind of curious, you know, as you've gone through this process, where have you sort of seen that like mindset of, of being able to show the value prop? Where have you seen that, you know, pay off throughout your career? As we've been discussing, you know, it really, first, you have to understand what's the language and frameworks and perceptions the other may have. And the other may be a user, a student, a family, you know, your CEO, your boss, and developing that trust where they can speak candidly and share more context around that experience. But being able to show that value pop and ROI, I mean, specifically for user researchers, but I would also argue strategists, consultants. I mean, this goes beyond. It's, I think, recognizing that you have to deliver on business goals at hand, uh, but also not just the existing goals, but be able to kind of forecast what may happen in the future. Now, I think that is kind of the in the ballpark of like a c-level executive like mm -hmm. forecasting what's going to happen in six you know 12 months down the road obviously we can't even predict what's going to happen in two days or mm -hmm. even a week from now i think that specifically in research um and you know as well as like design like anticipating the evolving needs of users how to sort through both qualitative and quantitative data that show signals 
and then translating those insights across the organization to make meaningful change. That's amazing. And so while you're learning all these things, you're figuring out the value you bring to, you know, an organization, education and everything like that. What was that experience of going through a layoff like for you? How long had you been there? And what was, uh, what was the situation? Did you sort of see it coming or did it come out of the blue? I was at uh, my previous company raised me for just over two and a half years. Um, and in terms of the, the layoff experience, when, when we got the news, uh, it was in early July uh, where we had to cut a third of the company. Uh, that was the first round of layoffs. Um, it, was definitely, it was definitely tough. I mean, I think especially in the startup world and an organization that has a strong emphasis on social impact, um, you know, increasing motivation and transparency toward better college going behaviors, you know, among, you know, populations of high school students, especially in disenfranchised realms. Um, my previous job at, at Reed underlined, I think, the stark reality that actually Warren Buffett talks about in his book, The Snowball, that people either win or lose the lottery. And that comes down to five digits, one zip code. And in this country, education is supposed to be that mobilizer. And I think there's a lot of case studies that indicate that may not be the case and raise me and the people there, you know, top to bottom across the organizations, people were there for that reason. You know, in the Silicon Valley, you can make twice as much more money, work maybe a quarter less hours, um, but you know, you may not have that reasoning that why would a capital W mm -hmm. and when I got the news, I think, you know, uh, first, first me reaction, I just, yeah, it's, I just had a lot of good memories flood in. Um, a lot of just like, man, I remember like when we worked four to eight o'clock doing user interviews at a nearby community-based organization, really trying to understand the student base more, under, like ensuring that we can validate what we're going to build for you know students like like them um you know it's eight o'clock and we're like eating some burritos in the mission like that that really stands out and like learning more about my colleagues that i may have not worked with as much and developing that foundation or you know having to struggle to advocate for you know certain user needs on the college side and finding ways moving kind of like water through like the cracks and you know just and that's just kind of like life to be honest um and finding allies but also finding people who would push back and somehow converting them to be like as part of this like vision and such um they're all integral um so i think a lot of those moments initially came and i think talking to my inner circle a lot of folks like you know you worked incredibly hard there i think it's time to take a break um I did not do that. <laughs> um, uh, immediately, I was already my last uh, to in uh, late late March. I enrolled for in a Springboard's user experience uh, design track, and so I think where I was at in my career, having a stronger foundation in user research, but definitely more on the strategy business operations side. But I became much more involved. Uh, working with designers, like doing certain user tests to figure out design requirements, et cetera, and wanting to be better understand, like, one, how do I be a better teammate with this side of, you know, an organization that I may encounter down the road? And part of that, again, it's like really understanding, like, how they think, how they perceive the world, what are, like, their frameworks that they use, but also, like, how can I better visualize insights that I've collected and you know, kind of, it's like baking bagels, you know, like you par bake, you boil the bagels in the water, and then you put them in the oven. Like, I want to boil the stuff. And, you know, it's ready to go for them. Uh, in my free time, I do a lot of bagel making. I was gonna so, say you that's a pretty, <laughs> you picked a pretty <laughs> complex analogy with bagels. I'm like, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've seen hard. people. Yeah, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've seen a video of someone making a bagel. And I had no idea that bagels got boiled. I was like, it blew my yeah. mind. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a hidden element. And, you know, throw some, you know, brown sugar, a little bit of baking soda in there. Baking soda you use for pretzels. 
and it creates that little bit of that browning hard shell. That's so good. And so, I mean, we're all indoors these days. So like, go <laughs> on the internet, bagels, you don't have to use lime. Like, no, just use some baking soda. And like, the first, honestly, seven batches are going to be terrible. It is all <laughs> iterative. But once you get that groove, mess and plot, everything in place, you have that system. And honestly, like, I know we're kind of spitballing here, but like, the startup environment, like, I look back, I'm just very appreciative of how those lessons I've learned in the kitchen, like, do kind of translate uh, into that rapid iteration. You know, we're building processes as we go. Um, some of them could be replicated down the road, but sometimes it's just like a one-off case. And so, I don't know, it's, it's been a fun journey. But going back specifically to the layoffs, um, immediately enrolled into the course, uh, started talking to a lot of folks in the user research uh, circles in Silicon Valley and, and in Los Angeles. Um, and after that subsided, I mean, I had a great number of conversations, also attended SF Design Week virtually, and there's this giant uh, UXR, user experience research conference held in uh, uh, digitally in Toronto. I was supposed to fly out there uh, and met some great user researchers. Um, you know, and like, I think a lot of user researchers can put, you know, words to emotions really well. And I, there are so many moments where I'm like, yes, like you are pre- we are binding, it's an <laughs> avatar, you know, like the two, oh, it's you know, binding, yes. And so, um, you know, I had like that euphoria high and then as life is, the sine curve starts yeah. trending downward. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, there is that sense of like loss of identity. Like I had a very strong purpose. I had a team. Um, I would still contact still some members of the team. Um, just to, you know, again, like these are some of my really good yeah. friends. And your work, seeing your them, colleagues become your, your environment. Exactly, yeah. And seeing, you know, them go through the grieving process of losing their colleagues. Um, Raise Me was acquired by another organization. So, you know, they're both, you know, new opportunities as well as challenges that come with that. Um, you know, helping some colleagues go through that transition as well. Um, offering some perspective on you know, projects that have continued on, luckily. Um, and that was like, you know, being the primary researcher on those projects, them asking for more context and such. But I think what really helped um, is, I think I really needed like time away from work uh, as, you know, I was just always putting a lot in. Um, I think having a proper sleep routine was like so important, especially with everything happening on a political, racial, economical, health level, just a lot of stuff. Um, and this hit and really you right, right. right when COVID was happening or when did the layoffs happen? Layoffs happened uh, the first week of June. Oh, wow. First week of June. Um, and so we're obviously seeing a lot of discussions in this country about race. Um, and it was really tough. Like, I think one of the things if I could go back in time and tell myself, um, which I guess I'm kind of doing so <laughs> through this podcast, yeah. but it, it's um, like, be very deliberate with the information you take in. You know, ultimately, like the thoughts really do control like the perception that we hold, like what type of glasses am I going to wear today? Um, I think about that a lot. I think it's very important to be informed, but you don't have to be depressed. Um, deleted Instagram. Uh, people still hook me up on Facebook Messenger, so I gotta keep that, keep that out. You really need to get off that platform. But, um, you know, I think it's, if you read the paper once a week, like you're gonna get the information that you need. People are already talking about it. Yeah. And I think it's, one of the things I still struggle with is like giving myself permission to just enjoy yourself. Um, I surf a lot, I cycle a lot, and sometimes like I still struggle with that guilt of I could be working on my portfolio. Um, I'm also, you know, I could be doing more schoolwork with that as a capstone project in, you know, I'm examining the informal millennial caregiving space. How do we design a better solution around there? I'm also working on a side project with a team of 11 helping independent service providers during COVID. It's, you know, I like present those verticals and I'm like, I would argue you're almost as busy as you were back at Raise Me. Um, and now is the time to take a step back. 
I haven't taken a step back in a really long time. I think they're only in the past, during my time at, at uh, Raise Me, it was really hard to turn off. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was going to burn out. And uh, I preemptively understood that. But I also wanted to get a lot of user research done after the holidays. My, one of my colleagues and I, we decided to sign up for a 10-day silent meditation retreat uh, at the uh, end of February. Amazing. And we, when we... When we left, uh, I think it was March 11th was when it concluded. And so that's when COVID started to hit. Uh, March 13th, uh, we had shelter in place installed in San Francisco. And so it was definitely an interesting time to enter the real world of sorts. I thought, I'm like, oh, like, equanimity and, you know, awareness. Like, I'm going to be all, like, just zen, you know. That was definitely not the case. I think I just became more aware of, like, the emotions. And I think that is the first step, maybe a business challenge or even working on yourself, like where are you at today? Mm -hmm. And working with that reality. Um, and that's something that, you know, I have my highs, I have my lows, but I think there's a lot more balance in my life. Um, and I don't, I don't attribute the imbalance due to being in a startup environment. Um, you know, I don't attribute that. I mean, definitely it has its challenges, but also opportunities. I think it mostly is, you know, as I'm reflecting and doing a lot of journaling, it's like, how do I become more aware with the emotions I may be feeling that come and go? You know, it's just like the ocean and the waves. Uh, I know right now some listeners may be like, there's a lot of hate street vibes happening right now from the San Francisco person. That's fine. Um, you know, the, it's just kind of my modus operandi. Um, come join a startup and then you'll see the light <laughs> that you need to take a 10 day retreat now. But yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. And I think just being deliberate with your thoughts, having a good, not only sleep, but also enjoyment routine, giving yourself permission, you know, even though people may be in a position where I need a job yesterday, you know, right now, like, Frankly, I thought the recession was going to happen last year was, and therefore was saving aggressively. And I have a fair amount of runway. Um, and so right now it's just like, how do I continue learning, um, developing my own skills and my network and currently in conversations with a number of companies. Uh, but right now I'm definitely earned more on the side of let's just be more deliberate with my own routine during this time. Yeah, I really love what you're putting out there, uh, especially that wave analogy. One of my um, favorite images that we've talked about on the live streams before is being a buoy on the waves, right? It may be very yes. calm, it may be very crazy, and you're just like, you know, trying doing yeah. that on the waves. And uh, it's also a very Zen thing. I, I actually picked up meditation again during um, all this quarantine stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the fun things that I listen to is like, you know, if you just stretch out time long enough, even mountains are waves, right? Like they erode mm -hmm. and they kind of come back up and go down and things like that. And so these, a lot of what we think is very immovable in the world and in our careers and these things that we think will be there forever typically don't stick around. And, and I, I like the impermanence idea and sort of how you're approaching all this stuff, right? You're bringing a lot of things into your life since your layoff. You're bringing in um, education, you're going, you know, getting re-educated, you're bringing in side projects, you're doing, well, the silent retreat was before, but you're being more deliberate with the information you gather. Another thing that I think is really interesting is being deliberate with the information you share as well. And I've been watching you, whoops, I've been watching you post on, uh, on LinkedIn quite a bit, and you've been sharing quite a few posts there as well. So I'm kind of curious as you're, you know, exploring all these new ideas and and, and trying not to, trying to both be productive and have fun and not beat yourself up for the ratios between the two, right? Um, where are you finding one feeds the other? Like I do find that without any fun relaxation, the job search suffers, but people think, well, if I just punish myself, I'll get a job faster, right? And then on the other side, if we don't do anything with the job search, then ugh, that's brutal as well. So how have you found them feed into one another, whether it's you know, I, I'm the, the idea that comes to mind for me is like, if you told that bagel story in an interview about how making bagels is similar to user research, that would be one of the most memorable interviews ever. <laughs> that would be fantastic. If you put that on your resume and said, interest <laughs> making bagels, like 
I think that would be absolutely amazing as like a, a fun little anecdote that you could bring into an yeah. interview to be memorable. But what are you seeing the interplay between the two since, since that is an area you're focusing so much on? But essentially, like, I think, at least for my brain and like my outlook, a lot of solutions or insights, like for instance, bagel making, I'm not going to be working as a user researcher and be like, oh, in order to become a better team player, I, I've got to go like bake some bagels. Like that's, that's not how it works. At least for me as a more, in an academic perspective, like a social science type of person, comparing myself to my engineering friends or my friends who are pursuing medical professions, it's very linear. Um, for me, it's like, how do I get inspiration from the things around me and like just paying attention, awareness? Because it's so easy just to get in routine and habits. How they play together, I mean, there's no golden ratio. I think it's relative to everyone. And definitely more of an art than a science. I think for me, like there are days where I'm working eight hours, which is way too much. And I got to check myself on that. Uh, but if there's a reasoning behind that, like, because you're going to take the next three days off and do like, you know, a bike packing trip or like go surf for two days, like, then sure. You know, I, I would say, pretty frankly, I'm still figuring that out. Like, I think that's fair. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, what, what, what month is it? It's, it's August. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hitting up on today's fourth. Yeah, it's been officially, yeah, like a couple months since. And I feel like I've finally started to be a little more forgiving to myself in terms of pace um, and recognize that, hey, there's a lot of good things happening in my life. And if I judge myself just on employment status, you know, it, it's easy to be in that mindset. I don't know, like I've, I've had a lot of discussions with with folks, obviously related with career, but even just talking, for instance, like to my neighbors, to my friends about like how to make bagels, you know, just doing something with people, obviously at a distance or just dropping them off and talking like, I think right now is just a good time to invest obviously into the career and position oneself. But like the reality is the market is not strong. And I think it's a great time to either learn professional skills. Um, there's a whole plethora of resources free and paid online, um, but also like develop a brand be very, being very frank as you've kind of said about bagel making like how many people how many korean americans are making bagels you know like i mean i'll be honest like i mean i felt that very strongly in portland portland oregon i'm like there aren't many many of me here if i make a food truck i don't think i make kimchi and bagels i don't think anyone's gonna come but uh, I don't know. That's, 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 you'd find some people, I'm sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe in Portland, Oregon. Uh, but it's it's definitely a, a process, and we'd love to hear from more folks. Actually, there's one thing. Um, I remember talking to a friend, and you know, he's like, "I'm gonna preface this by like, you're gonna have your Goodwill hunting moment." I'm like, what the hell is that? Uh, he's like, "It's not your fault." And I was just like. Yeah, you're right. I think he's hitting something that I forgot to remind myself that when we just had a huge event that like hit our market and people's minds pretty, pretty like dramatically. Um, even if you had, you know, the most, uh, you know, sensible, strong foresight leadership and processes in place, everyone's getting impacted by this. And I think especially being in a startup environment, you always think you could do more with if you had more resources, the what if. Um, and that's why I think it's very important to be grounded in the reality. And I, I found myself, you know, after the first two weeks, you know, it's like three calls a day, two conferences during the week. It's just a lot of information. And then afterwards, where it's just silence. That was definitely. You know, you, you go to bed and you think like, what the heck did I just do in my day? Like, where's my purpose? And then you start retroactively thinking, I could have done something different, et cetera. And again, there's no one to blame. You know, I think this uh, quick plug for user research, <laughs> like, you know, like you got to better understand your users during this time. Are you actually delivering services and experiences catered to their social, emotional and, and functional circumstances? especially with COVID, you know, pre post COVID, I remember looking at a, uh, a chart, you know, we have X and Y axis, we have four quadrants, the Delta of the possibility of a vaccine, along with the Delta of COVID cases emerging and 
in you know disappearing in terms of new cases we have four different scenarios how does a business function in all those four hypothetical realities that may come and go? you know it's just like the ocean and that is something when i'm speaking with companies or just on my own researching just understanding like this is the new reality that would be functioning and those are the variables that we could use as frameworks and then i'm like you need to take a step back and go for a walk and like eat some quinoa like a healthy meal and a salad because you've been a sad person you ate chinese food for a whole week straight like you're not taking care of like, like that's that's that is the reality <laughs> like oh yeah fundamentals like you know and so yeah <laughs> yeah i love that and i think that idea of like you know we are responding to everything that's happening in the world yep. we're not creating it and i think that's a really big thing uh to keep in mind especially when you look at the marketplace right and when we have our days like the bounce back comes from being kind to yourself right from saying yes. all right it's a new day a new start and now we're going to move forward and you mentioned personal brand and i'm kind of curious what what sort of things have you started to do to put yourself out there i've been I'm a big believer that good questions make you rich, not monetarily. Maybe that's like a byproduct of it, but it's just perspective, time to engage, ask even better questions down the road. And at least for me, my approach at work was, here's a meaningful question. I may have a couple of hypothetical answers to it, but I think a question is more of a beacon for people to, it's more, much more approachable in a more open environment as opposed to here's the answer and this is what we're going to do. People get defensive, people are more reactive. It's much more in like inviting of sorts. I think LinkedIn is a wonderful tool right now. I think a lot of people are active, especially folks in the user research and design realms. Um, I personally don't post a lot of content. I just like things. Uh, and then I follow said person because I'm just kind of curious what they continue curating out. You know, I've been reaching out to folks just like, Hey, like some of the, pretty baseline questions I ask as a user researcher talking to a designer or user researcher, baseline question, what are the three biggest challenges your company is facing right now? You know, either from business or like process standpoint. And secondly, you know, how have you and your career kind of flowed like water? You know, how have you grown throughout your career, but also where you're at right now, how do you deal with the challenges where you may not have enough resources or leadership doesn't think it's prioritized, but you as a researcher, you firmly believe that this is a problem you're solving. How do you carry that message downstream when there's so many obstacles? And it's interesting hearing that from similar ed tech startup environments, larger organizations like the FANG folks. And so I'm just trying to get a better sense. Like, you know, I spent time in a bureaucratic environment at Reed. I've spent time in a startup environment at Raise Me. You know, what type of company culture and spectrum of bureaucracy do I look for? You know, I think there are pros and cons to both. Um, but I think that's a big question I've been asking myself. And just being able to learn from people about that is quite helpful. I love that. And so as we get toward the end of the, uh, the episode here, I'd, I'd love to get some perspective from you on what you're looking for next. So what are the things that, you know, as you are out there talking to people and learning about different industries and, and, and doing your exploration, what is, uh, what's rising to the surface? What seems to be the right direction? Yeah, I think um, this kind of goes back I, uh, to, to a resource that I've, I've gone back to multiple times. It's by Gibson Biddle, the former VP of design uh, at, or oh, sorry, not design, product uh, at, at Netflix. And he had this great article, how to, how, to fi- how to Find a Job, Biddle, Google, you'll find it. Pretty simple steps in terms of, as opposed to applying for roles, really communicate to your network what you're looking for. So it comes with that awareness and that value proposition. And also being able to balance, you know, yourself, many things that we've talked about today. But what I'm looking for, what kind of rises as I'm thinking about and reflecting during this time is being able to work for an organization that really does care about the feedback loop with its users. Especially in technology environment, there's an opportunity for that. Um, But really understanding like whether or not we are building designs for solutions that we just have thought of inside the room by ourselves, 
or have iterated with users and brought their feedbacks, voice to customer programs. Those are all things that we had at Raise Me the last three months. And we started getting that momentum, not only process, but also philosophy. So that was beautiful. But, you know, being able to have an environment similar to that, as well as making a social impact. I have a you know, huge background in education, but I'm also trying to challenge my you know, assumptions and frameworks I hold in that space with a millennial and formal caregiving project, as well as a slightly more uh, B2C uh, project related with COVID, and just trying to keep the mind flexible. But I think right now it's definitely more the social impact space, user research, and uh, how can I add value as I better understand that business model at hand and being able to bring users into that journey that ultimately drives business objectives. That's amazing. Are there any companies that are like top of your list? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple folks, um, some of which I've, I've been in conversation. I think the e-learning space is very interesting during this time. Um, the valuation of higher ed is obviously very questionable. Uh, it has been questionable. And as someone who's been in it, uh, there are colleges out there that cost mm -hmm. $65,000 a year. The ROI is questionable. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, and part of it, it's more of a policy question. Yeah. yeah there are definitely companies, e-learning spaces. You know, I'm also really interested in last time I checked, people are getting older, millennial and formal caregiving. It's going to be yeah. a huge challenge. There are 40 million caregivers in the United States. A quarter of them are millennials. We have a lot of student loan debt. We may be far away from parents. We value autonomy, but here's this new responsibility that's most of the time just thrown on folks. And so I've been spending actually the past month, you know, really researching and speaking with folks in that space and being able to really understand like what's a small design or experience that could help people out in the context of their social, emotional, and functional circumstances. But I mean, there are a couple of folks that, you know, right now I've enjoyed speaking to, but I'm trying to keep it as broad as possible. I think you've, I think you've given enough there for anyone who is listening, who knows of opportunities in those two spaces. How could they get a hold of you to let you know? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, you know, Wayne Kim, pretty simple, two first names. Um, and you can also, I don't really tweet, deleted Instagram, don't prefer Facebook. But yeah, just reach out on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat with folks. Not only folks who are obviously hiring for roles, but really just anyone in the user research space or user experience space from a design product research perspective. Um, I think what I've learned from the recent conferences, just being able to circulate frameworks as well as challenges, because frameworks are just models. You throw them out in reality, some of them disappear. Like the analogy I use, it's like walking into a rainstorm with cotton candy. Mm -hmm. It just, oh, it's like, Whatever, that didn't matter. But how does that framework or strategy exist, again, in like the context or circumstance? That for me, it's like, if, if I'm seeing similarities, this may work in my like challenge that I'm facing a side project or a future organization. So I like to swap notes and also like all the user researchers, researchers out there, most of us are teams of one. It's lonely at times and it's like hard to advocate and work across teams and also like, have your own professional career and sanity. And so always happy to, to connect with folks in the field. I love it. And I love the Zen hustle that you're bringing to your job search. It's really cool. Um, it's a good day. Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wayne, thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone go check them out on LinkedIn. And uh, this has been the Career Therapy Podcast. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Awesome. Thanks so much for stopping by this episode of the Career Therapy Podcast. It's been a pleasure having you. And if you're curious about what we do here at Career Therapy, head on over to www.careertherapy.com to see all of our coaching options, resources, and links to other things we got going on. If you would like to share your story on this podcast, something that you've gone through, a transition you've experienced in your career, whether it's getting a job after college or going through a layoff or getting back into the workforce after raising your family, we would love to hear from you. Head over to linkedin.com slash in slash Martin McGovern and shoot me a DM. Let me know what's going on and I 
really like to share your story with the world. What we're trying to do here is really normalize the emotional side of the job search because we all go through it. We all have tough times in our careers and sharing these stories really helps people feel less alone and feel more empowered to take their career back into their own hands and make something of it. So thank you again for stopping by. If you'd like to leave a like or a comment, subscribe or share, or leave us a review on iTunes, and I think maybe even Spotify, we'd really appreciate it. Best of luck to you in all of your career endeavors, and I'll see you on the next episode. Cheers.